Welcome back everybody, my name is Tucker, this is Sporting Logically, and welcome to the final video of the week, Free Agent Friday. This is a series where every Friday I take a look at one player that's eligible to become a free agent this summer, and I discuss the situation, what kind of contract they could sign for, and which teams they could sign with. I put up a poll yesterday to decide who would be featured this week and got over 4,000 responses, which is awesome by the way, thank you guys so much, and the decision by a wide margin was LeBron James. As a side note, I plan on putting out polls a few times a week for you guys to decide some of the content choices I make, especially with some of the weekly series going on on the channel, so be on the lookout for those. As I said, this week I'll be talking about LeBron James, and as a result of that, this video will take on a bit of a different format. Normally, I would give some background and talk about the contract the player could sign before moving on to the possible teams they could join, but I'm not going to waste anyone's time talking about the entire picture that most, if not all of you already know. I'll just put out a few of the most important things and then we'll move on to the teams. There have been rumors swirling for months that LeBron is considering leaving Cleveland once again this season, and as bad as the supporting cast has looked in the post-Kyrie era, it seems more and more likely with each game. The difference this time compared to 2010 or 2014, the years in which he previously left the team in free agency, is that there are multiple destinations that are openly talked about and acknowledged by the media and even by James's own teammates. In terms of the contract, it's almost certain that wherever he goes, he will sign a two-year max with a player option for the second year, otherwise known as a one-in-one -one deal. I highly doubt he would take a significant pay cut to play anywhere, and the only reason he would take less than the max is if it was only slightly less if a team for some reason couldn't find a way to clear enough space for the full max. Alright, with that done, let's get on to the best part, the teams. Let's begin with the Cleveland Cavaliers. I'm just going to be 100% honest, if LeBron James decides to stay in Cleveland, it won't be for basketball reasons. Of all the other realistic options he has, the Cavaliers have the worst constructed roster and the lowest chance of competing for championships moving forward. Now while you could argue that that has a lot to do with LeBron being there in the first place, it doesn't change the fact that staying in Cleveland would be the worst basketball destination of any of the options I'm going to talk about in this video. Having said that, I don't think it's completely out of the question to consider that he might still be a Cav this time next year. I've honestly written off this idea for a while now, but I was listening to Brian Winhorst on the Bill Simmons podcast a week or two ago, and he said something that made me rethink my position a bit. The short of it was that LeBron's kids are older now than when they left Cleveland the first time, or even when he left Miami, and his family could have a much bigger input on his decision than in the past as a result. Obviously, he always considered his family in the past, but his kids likely have a much stronger voice this time around, according to Winhorst. So if they speak up and say that they really enjoy being in Cleveland, maybe that will be enough to convince him to stay. If he does stay, the 8th overall pick that they have at their disposal via the Kyrie Irving trade is their only real weapon for improvement at this point. If they hit that pick out of the park, it could set them up to compete in the East for the next few years and to continue to build a successful team once LeBron retires. Or if they so choose, it's the only real trade chip that they have that could bring back anything of increased value to the team. They have other guys they could trade, namely Kevin Love, but whoever they get in return likely wouldn't help move the needle much. The biggest problem they face is they just don't have the depth on the wings or in general to match other teams in the East anymore, much less win a championship. They need to add more than just the one guy they'll draft with the 8th pick or the player they trade for it. So as a result, from strictly a basketball standpoint, even if the Cavs somehow make it to the finals, I would start preparing for another LeBron departure if I was a Cleveland fan. Moving on to by far the most complicated option on the table for James, the Houston Rockets. Now while there have been plenty of reports that Houston wouldn't even be interested in James, there have also been plenty of reports that LeBron is interested in coming to Houston, so I'm going to keep them on the short list. There's a lot to go over here, so be prepared. You might be wondering why on earth the Rockets wouldn't be interested in signing one of the three best players in the league right now, and that's because they would essentially have to gut their entire roster that just won over 60 games in the regular season to do so. At first glance, it doesn't seem like they'd have to do anything that drastic. If the Rockets don't re-sign any of their free agents, they'd have about $25 million in cap space this summer, and by trading away either Ryan Anderson or Eric Gordon's contract, they would have enough space to sign LeBron to a max deal. Easy, right? The problem is that two of their three best players, Chris Paul and Clint Capella, are free agents and are due to sign big deals. You're probably thinking that that isn't a problem, just have these guys hold off on re-signing until the team brings in LeBron with cap space, and then use those bird rights to sign them and go over the cap. Well, it isn't quite that easy. First of all, Capella is a restricted free agent that has had a great season and has performed extremely well in the playoffs, so he's likely ready to sign his first big NBA contract that is well deserved. 
If a team throws an offer sheet Capella's way and he signs it, then the Rockets would only have three days to match it or they'd lose their up and coming big man. So essentially the Rockets would have to convince Capella, who once again hasn't signed a big contract in the league yet, to wait on signing any offer sheets until after they've convinced LeBron to come to Houston. They would then have to do the same with Chris Paul, who's an unrestricted free agent and due for a raise from the 24 plus million dollars he made this season. CP3 would wait until after they've signed LeBron with their cap space, then he would get his big contract and they'd have their super team. If I made that sound easy to do, then I apologize because it really isn't. Trading either Anderson or Gordon away when there are only a few teams with cap space to absorb those deals and those teams would know that they'd be helping to create another Western Conference superpower really wouldn't be easy. Then convincing two separate players and their agents to sacrifice their own financial security so the team could sign LeBron is no small task either. You might think that would be the end of the complexities, but no. Here's the thing, and feel free to laugh at me later, but I think Clint Capella will make at least 15 to 20 million dollars next season. He's a fantastic five man for the modern NBA, and the Rockets really don't want to lose him. So teams know it will take a big offer sheet to pry him away. His finishing skills at the rim, shot blocking ability, and quickness in defending ball screens and perimeter players on switches are worth a lot of money around the league. If all of these things happen and the Rockets make the proper trades and convince CP3 and Capella to wait around, and they sign LeBron, and Paul gets a max deal, and Capella gets a big offer sheet, the Rockets will basically have to trade all of their remaining contracts away and fill out the rest of their roster with minimum salary guys. Let's say for the sake of argument that Capella signs a deal that pays him $18 million in the first year of his contract and that LBJ and CP3 both signed for the max. When you add in James Harden, even if they traded everybody else off the roster, the Rockets will have committed $120 million to those four players alone for the 2018-19 season, and as a result, will already be over the luxury tax. And that's with Harden making less than the current league max. In 2019, his super max deal that he signed last summer kicks in, and he starts making $37 million, then $40 million the year after that, then over $40 million the following two seasons. That is a huge financial commitment on top of gutting the entire roster of a 60-win team. The luxury tax bill would be astronomical, and if we're being honest, it still wouldn't even guarantee a Western Conference championship because of how good the Warriors are. They could let Capella walk or try and convince Paul or James to take a bit of a pay cut to lessen the burden, but when you look at all the things that would have to come together to make this a reality, it would take some true roster management wizardry from the front office in Houston to make it happen. From a basketball standpoint, it would obviously be fantastic to see those four guys playing together, and that could really appeal to James. But I can't stress enough how difficult it would be to make it happen and how incredibly expensive it would be. All right, now on to a slightly less complicated situation, the Philadelphia 76ers. I actually recently made a video on why the team shouldn't sign LeBron, so I won't spend a ton of time on this section, and if you're interested in more about the Sixers, I'll leave the link to that video in the description below. Essentially, they would have to trade Jared Bayless's contract and let all of their other free agents walk to have the max space available to sign James this summer. Though the fit is questionable with a ball-dominant player that doesn't provide any spacing in Ben Simmons, already entrenched as the lead ball handler, not to mention the fact that the team would have to let most of their high-level shooters and floor spacers walk to create the space to sign LeBron, the young talent and potential of the roster might be too much to resist. After playing without Kyrie Irving this year, James would likely welcome the opportunity to have another talented playmaker on the floor with him to take some of the responsibility off of him once again. Having the best low post player in the league in Joel Embiid would be a welcome sight as well, and though as I said, spacing could be an issue, the team could likely sign some veterans at a discount that could help them in that area once they see that LeBron wants to come to Philly. Add in the fact that should they choose to do so, they have the ammunition to trade for another star such as Kawhi Leonard or even a sign and trade for Paul George since they wouldn't have the space to sign him outright after bringing in James. All these factors create a great basketball situation without the messy roster construction and salary cap issues of the Houston situation. While Philly will eventually have to deal with those kinds of things down the road, once Ben Simmons is eligible for what is likely a max deal a few years from now, especially if they bring in another star in addition to LeBron, it isn't as immediate of an issue as it would be should LeBron decide to take his talents to Houston. Overall, the Sixers are a good option in terms of basketball talent and the ability to compete for championships. Though as I said, spacing and fit are things that would need to be addressed. Going to Philly also has the added benefit to LeBron of staying in the weaker Eastern Conference, albeit with a strong Celtics team to face for the foreseeable future. The last team up is the one that I now think is most likely and is also my prediction for the winner of the LeBron sweepstakes this summer, the LA Lakers. 
they have a ton of salary coming off the books this summer and with some rather minor changes, could have the space to realistically sign two players at or near the max this offseason. The other likely candidate would be Paul George, and they could even try and swing a trade for another star after that, either for Kawhi Leonard or a sign and trade for DeMarcus Cousins, though they'd have to give up a significant amount of young assets to do so. The team would likely keep Lonzo Ball in any of these scenarios, giving them a lineup including Ball, PG-13, and LBJ to go along with up-and-coming players like Brandon Ingram or Kyle Kuzma. Or they could go all-in and trade those young players as I mentioned, giving them a four-man unit of those three along with either Leonard or Cousins. Just like with Philly, this would create some salary cap and luxury tax issues down the road, but again it wouldn't be as immediate of a problem as it would be for the Rockets. From a basketball perspective, that's a pretty good situation to go to and is certainly much more promising than Cleveland. There obviously isn't a guarantee that Paul George will become a Laker, but I would be shocked if he didn't take the opportunity to come to LA like he's been hinting at for years now. In terms of the non-basketball side of things, there's a lot to like about the Lakers as well. First of all, you obviously have the prestige of the organization, but along with that, his family could have a big preference toward the city as well. They live in LA during the offseason, and if LeBron's family wants to live there full time, that would likely have a big impact on his decision. Not to mention the fact that LBJ would get the chance to be around Magic Johnson and learn from him as a businessman and basically set himself up for life after basketball with all the opportunities that LA provides. If you put all those things together, it really does seem like LeBron James signing with the Lakers is the most likely outcome of his free agency this summer. But as always, I would love to see what you guys have to say in the comments below. And that is the end of the video, thank you all very much for watching. If you liked it, then leaving a like rating is a great way to let me know, and if you'd like to see more videos just like this, then be sure to subscribe to Sporting Logically for more content every single week. Thanks again, and I will see you all next time.